Hi, and welcome to Waveform Science. I'm Jeff Hagen. By the time you see this, Bluetti will have announced their next power station, the AC60. We're going to spend, I'm going to spend the next couple days, you're going to spend the next hour or so, and we're going to go through the features and specs of this device. We're going to run a whole bunch of tests on it, and we're going to see how good it is. So, first off, a little disclaimer. Uh, I am not paid to do reviews. This is not a monetized channel, um, and it will not be. Uh, I make my money elsewhere. I do work in the tech industry. I do not work in the solar generator industry. I do not make any money off these. Bluetti does not pay me to make these, uh, nor, nor would I let them. Uh, and uh, the product itself, they did send me a review unit because I have one, and it hasn't come out yet, so they had to have sent it to me. Otherwise, how would I have gotten it? Um, but it is a prototype, um, and as all things, uh, prototypes tend to be half-baked, so it's not like I'm making tons of money off of them. Uh, I, during this video, I will be comparing the uh, AC60 to two of their older models, and I will call out this EB3A that I have sitting up here. This is also a prototype model from the review video that I did about a year ago in the series of things that I've done on the EB3A. I'm also comparing it to an EB55, uh, this one I purchased. So... The AC60, uh, what does it come with in the box? First off, um, it comes with a power cable, just a regular power cable, no brick. Uh, it comes with a uh, solar cable, uh, DC7909 to MC4, same as Blue Eddie uses on other things. And it comes with a uh, car charger, same as they use on others. That's it, that's all that's in the box. Well, the user manual, of course. Uh, the specs for the device, it is a 600-watt uh, inverter, it is a 400-watt-hour battery, and from there they start adding new stuff. Um, as I said, it doesn't need a power brick, because the power brick's built in. Uh, the big killer feature is it's IP65 waterproof. The whole thing is IP65 waterproof while it's on, um, with some caveats, of course. Um, I'm going to have to do a separate review video on that before... I can show you, though, because, as I said before, uh, this is a prototype, and it's half-baked. Uh, Bluetti told me that my unit, this particular one, is not waterproof, and uh, the retail units will be waterproof. So I'm going to see if I can borrow a retail unit from somebody so I can do a waterproofing testing on it later. But for today, you'll just have to take my word on it that Bluetti says this is IP65 waterproof. Now, IP65, what does that mean? Um, IP6 is the dust proofing, that's the highest level of dust proofing, so you can use this at a construction site near a table saw that's, you know, throwing off sawdust and you don't have to worry about the dust getting in. Uh, five for waterproofing is not the highest level, so you cannot submerge it, it should not be sitting in a puddle. But if you go camping and you leave it sitting out and there's a rainstorm and it gets rained on, it's not going to hurt, in theory. I haven't tested it yet. Um, when I get a device that I can test it on, you're certain that I will. <laughs> so that's that's going to get tested a little later. Uh, other features that are new, of course, obviously no, no power brick, um, new user interface. Uh, the buttons are different. We're going to go. We're going to cover that. Um, the connectors are a little bit different. There's some new connectors on here. Uh, another big one. If we look on the side. Ooh, it's got little baby battery ports. Uh, they, this is just like the AC200 Max in that it can control external batteries. Now, another one that I will call out, the B80 battery. This is going to be a 800-ish uh, watt-hour battery. The specs are appearing on the screen there. I don't have one of those yet. Uh, <laughs> they're not available. Even the prototypes aren't out yet. So at this time, um, I have some connectors I can show you, uh, but I can't actually make it do anything. So you're not going to see any review of the external battery in this video, that will be another video, and that will be a fairly extensive video to go through that uh, piece of battery when it does arrive, whenever it is that it arrives. Um, but sure enough, I will attempt to get one if Blue Eddie wants to send me one. So those are the big features. Um, let's go through the rest of them one by one. What does it weigh? According to my scale, 20.3 pounds. Now the spec says 18.9. Mine says 
I've been told the difference is because mine is a non-waterproof prototype. It was constructed using slightly different materials than the retail version, so that's the difference in the weight. At least that's what I was told. Comparing this to a couple other units, EB3A should be much lighter. In fact, half the weight, 10.1 pounds, as expected. And EB55, which we're going to be comparing to all day, 15.8 pounds. However, this EB55 comparison is not fair because both the AC60 and the EB3A, neither one of them needs power brick to charge. EB55 needs one. So let's put that in the weight. There's a power brick. 17.6, but I'm not convinced that's still a fair, fair exercise because this is only going to charge at 200 watts from this power brick. Both the EB3A and the AC60 can charge faster than 200 watts with nothing but a power cable. So let's give it another power brick. There we go. Now we're at 19.5 pounds. The weight chart you're seeing here has the poundage on it, but it also has energy storage per pound, weight per pound. And you can see, or excuse me, watt hours per pound. And you can see that the uh, EB55 of the three units has the most watt hours per pound. However, the EB55 also has the least features. When you add additional features into the device, like built-in chargers, faster chargers, uh, the uh, AC60 charges much faster than EB55 does, even with two adapters, um, the controlling of external batteries, uh, waterproof nature, you're going to wind up with um, more weight in the device. And I'm kind of okay with that. It's still portable in its current form. It's not to the point where it's not portable. And it does a lot more than the existing devices do. What are the physical dimensions of the AC60? Yeah. About 11 and a half on my tape measure. The spec sheet says 11.41, so that's about right. I'm looking at about a little over 9 on my uh, tape measure. Specs say 9.21, so that agrees. And depth, I'm looking at about 7.5 here on the tape measure. Um, specs say a little more. Specs say 8.07. Am I reading that wrong? Oh, yeah, it comes out to the end of the uh, rubber here. So, yes, specs are correct. Dimensions as compared to the other devices. Um, again, I turned it into cubic inches, and I turned it into energy density of uh, watt hours per cubic inch. And you can see, again, the AC60 is the lowest of the devices, lowest energy density per, uh, per space. But uh, plainly, that's because it's got other things in there, battery controllers and such, that the other devices don't have. And those are going to use up some space. So this is going to be a little bit of a bigger, heavier unit because it's got more stuff in it. And what connectors do we have? First off, on the DC side, we have the cigarette lighter port. Pretty much all solar generators have one of those. Next, we are missing, notably missing, is the two DC barrel jack ports. Those, are, those have been removed. The um, only reason I was given for that is not everybody uses them. Um, but I will lament the loss of the DC barrel jacks. Um, USB-C port. 100 watt, supposedly. We'll test that. USB-A port, two 5 volt, 3 amp USB-A ports, no quick charge ports. We have on the front two power sockets. These are NEMA 520 sockets, not your normal NEMA 515 house sockets. I will be showing the difference here. The 520 sockets are normally used for 20 amp circuits. Now, 600 watt device, that's less than 6 amps at 120 volts. So, you're not going to get 20 amps out of this port. So, if you have a device with a plug, as we are showing now, 
that has the one of the tongs turn 90 degrees. It likely needs 20 amps of power. It will physically fit into this port, but it probably isn't going to work. What do we have on the side? Solar connector, DC7909, just like Bluetti's been using on all their smaller devices. We have a fuse holder here. Right there, you need a screwdriver to get to that. We have a grounding lug. That's a nice addition, very, very welcome addition for the grounding lug. The grounding lug's purpose is for events and or gigs where people are being paid. And typically OSHA or other regulatory bodies require that portable generators are grounded, even though the electrical code does not require them to be grounded. That's actually a little bit challenging on some of Blue Eddy's other devices. Um, I will show you this uh, EB3A as an example. On this EB3A, you can actually see the power port has no ground hole. There's just a hole, physical hole in the device. There's nothing to actually plug the ground lug into. So even if you could ground this device, it wouldn't pass the ground along. That's been completely fixed in the AC60. So first off, power plugs themselves have real ground holes. This ground is bonded to that ground as it should be. Those two grounds are bonded to this screw which, by the way, is also bonded to the grounding lug in the power cord. So everything is grounded as it should be, which is very, very good. And if you go to an event, um, a county fair or a, a job site uh, that requires a grounded device, you have an ability to ground it now. So that's a good thing. Uh, many people won't need it, but it's a good thing for the people that need it. And, of course, we've got the AC power inlet. No charging brick needed, just plug a cord straight in. On the back of the device, which I need to hit the power button here to make it work, we have the uh, the diffused type light. Push the button to get to turn on. Push it again to make it brighter. Push it a third time for either blink mode or SOS, whichever you prefer. And on this side, big fan inlet here. And we have the two ports for the external battery that I mentioned. Uh, I don't have the battery, I can't plug it in, but you'll see that there are data pins here and power pins, so this is a smart controller. And uh, let me show you a uh, comparison to the AC200's connector. Uh, this is the connector for the AC200 Max. You can see how big it is compared to this device. Uh, there is there's no chance. This, this AC200 Max connector is not going to fit in there. So the possibility of a B230, B300, or B300S battery plugging into this port natively is very unlikely. Um, possible. I mean, Blue Eddy could come out with some sort of cable magic, and I love the idea of batteries working on multiple devices, so I'd love that. But natively, no, the connector is not physically going to fit. The voltage is different, too, so that's problematic. Close this back up. And that's what we have for connectors on here. Physical controls on the device. So this works a little differently than other Blue Eddies. So we have a power button, a DC button, and an AC button. The DC button, there's a little line with an arrow points at DC. There's a little line with an arrow points at AC. The AC button turns these on. The DC button turns these on. However, there's a power button. So if I just press the DC button, absolutely nothing happens. So what I have to do first First, I have to press and hold the power button to get it to turn on. Uh, which, by the way, it does turn on on its own when you plug in either AC power or DC power. It turns on on its own just fine. Now that it's on, now I can turn on the DC side. And I get this little fan icon. That means the fan spinning. And I get this little antenna-looking, Wi-Fi-looking icon. That means the wireless charging port on the top is turned on. And I can turn on AC, and notice that the uh, meter, the guesstimate of how long it's going to stay alive, uh, goes down when I turn the AC side on. Because the inverters and the, and the DC side, they both use power. So if you leave this turned on, you're going to run out eventually. 
turn them back off. And I can turn off the whole unit by press and hold. If I just tap it, it turns the screen off. Tap it again, turns it on, press and hold. Turns it off. Okay, Blue Eddy's mobile app. So they've changed the app a little bit here for this particular device. And let me show you what we've got here. Turn it on first. And bring up the app. So we have the main screen here with all your devices. I can hit the Bluetooth button to connect. This, by the way, this is a Bluetooth, not a Wi-Fi device. There is no Wi-Fi on this device. I bring up the main screen. Now I can turn on the DC side. You'll see it turn on. I can turn on the AC side. You'll see that turn on. I can turn them both off. So you can remote control it just fine. If you tap on the PV icon, it's going to give you power, voltage, and current. Very nice. Which, by the way, interestingly, isn't displayed on the screen anywhere. So the only way you can see this is through the app. If you tap on the grid input, you get power, current, and frequency. In fact, let's plug in some power here and see what it does. So if I give it some power, give it a moment to detect it. There we go. Now it's got 60 hertz, 59 hertz. So it can tell us what we're running at. Now the battery is fully charged, so it's not actually going to charge. But it will tell us um, what's coming in from the input. Uh, same for DC. Um, if I were to plug in a DC power source, see this DC power supply right here. All right, back up and I go to PV. It's going to tell me I'm at 25.9 volts. I've got no power coming in because the battery's full. And uh, no current because, again, the battery's full. If I tap on the DC output, nothing happens. I tap on the AC output. I can read the power, voltage, and current of the AC output. Again, it's not on the screen. If I tap on the icon in the center, I get my battery SOC uh, in detail and the battery packs, which I presume that additional battery packs would show up here if there was more of them connected. There isn't. There's battery pack button, which goes to the same thing that happens when you hit the middle. And I can scroll down. There's nothing else down there. I do have a little gear, though. So what do I have in the app that's not anywhere else? So first, I've got the same three charging modes that the EB3A does. I have a standard, I have a silent, and I have a turbo mode. We'll talk about those in a minute, and I'll show you what they look like. We have two eco mode controllers, DC and AC. Bring those up, expand them so you can see what's in there. So you can set the time, shutdown time, 4, 3, 2, 1. And a new one, first for Blue Eddy, you can set the power level in watts and put as few or as many watts as you want in there. So if you're using DC eco mode, that means it will shut off the DC side after four hours of using less than five watts. That's what that means. Uh, the AC side as well, I can set it to 10 watts or whatever number of watts I want and uh, I can set it to the number of hours. Very handy. Now I can turn the light on and off. There we go, put the light on. Turn the light back off just like any other Bluetooth device. can update the firmware, which there shouldn't be any right now anyway. But this is the pre-release version that I'm running right now. There's a BMS version button because the batteries themselves have separately upgradable firmware. And again, there probably isn't any right now. They've added another new menu, the advanced setting menu. Let's go in there and see what's in there. First off, the inverter output frequency, that's 60 hertz. So that's the standard for the US. So please don't change that if you live in the U.S. Um, if you live somewhere else, you'd set it for wherever your country is. And grid boosting mode. That's a new mode for the UPS, and we will be discussing that in detail at the near the end of this video. We'll be going through the UPS modes and how they work at the end. But the grid boost mode is just an on-off. Turn it on, turn it off, and we'll talk about how it is that that works and exactly what it does at the end. Um, only thing I did miss is I missed that there is also power lifting mode in this device. And that's the app. USB port test. Let's just make sure the USB ports are what they say they are. 
Blue Eddy is usually really good about this, so I don't have any expectations that this is not going to work. First, the USB C. And the USB C port is a power delivery 3.0 PPS port, which is advertising itself as being able to support 105 watts, which is a little bit over the spec of 100 watts. So, very nice there. Now, let's try the regular USB ports. Try the first one here. It is, in fact, just a regular 15 watt USB port, unfortunately. Nothing special there. And the second regular USB port is... Also, unfortunately, just a regular USB port. Now, these are, by the way, the same port specifications that are on the EB3A. Just regular USB ports. Um, I do kind of wish they'd put a quick charge port on there for Android users, but um, it kind of is what it is. But they are, in fact, as advertised. So, I have the DC side turned on. We're going to be testing the wireless charging pad. What I have here is a wireless charging pad test device. This device does not actually have any batteries in it or any way of powering itself, except for the fact that it powers off a wireless charging pad. So if there's no charging pad, it won't even turn on. So let's uh, center this on the pad here. And... Convince it to run the test. There we go. Just had to have it centered there. That test passed at 5 watts. Flip the switch here. 15 watts. And it passes. So, I would say wireless charging pad. Yeah, that works. Okay, DC output max drain test. Most cigarette lighter adapters can handle somewhere between 8 and 12 amps. Let's see what this one can handle. First, we've got it turned on. We've got the DC side turned on. I've got my tester hooked up. Let's start pulling power. Six, seven amps. Let's get up to eight. Some cars cut off at eight amps, by the way. This seems to handle eight just fine. We're at nine. No problems there. 10. And we have dropped in voltage. We are at 4 volts. 4.5 volts at 10. And if I lower it back down a little bit to 9.95, we are at 12 volts. However, interestingly, it has not cut off the output. That's kind of odd. Let's keep going and see if we can get it to cut off. 0.7, 0.8, 11, 11.4, 11.5, and 0. So it looks like the cutoff is at 11.5 amps, but at 10 amps it drops below a usable voltage. And at this point it is in fact throwing a short error, which I would expect it to. Now, let's see what that looks like in the app. So, inside the mobile app, I can bring it up. I have my list of devices here. Let me connect to the AC60. And you can see that it still says the DC side is on. Zero, volt, zero watts coming out of it. However, at the very top, there's an exclamation mark that says DC output short circuit. So there's your problem right there. So it tells you what the issue is. Now, tapping on this does nothing. So you can see the error, but you can't actually fix it. To fix the error, what you have to do is press and hold on the blinking until it turns off. Then you have to turn down whatever device you had that caused it to short in the first place, or it's just immediately going to short as soon as you turn it back on. 
So let's just turn that almost all the way down. There we go. All the way down. Turn it back on. And DC output once again. So the DC output, max load test. For this next test, we're going to do the AC max load test. So my test setup here involves a heater. It's about a thousand watt heater, which is more than the AC60 can handle. And I have what's called a Variac. Uh, this gives me a variable AC. Basically allows me to do a smooth turn on and turn down of this heater. So I've got the AC side here already turned on. Let's turn this on. I've got it set real low down here. Got to get it just high enough for the heater to kick on. There we go. Heater's kicked on. So now I am at 200 watts, 250 watts. Let's give it some more. It can definitely handle that. 300, 400, 500, 800, 900, 1,000, 1,000 watts output, 1,100. There we go, overload. That was actually pretty impressive. Got up to 1100 watts. Let's try that again, this time a little slower. Clear the overload by press and hold. Turn this back down again so it doesn't immediately overload as soon as I turn it on. Okay, I have power. Give the fan a minute to kick on. We go now, it's more or less settled. Give it a little bit more voltage here. Be careful not to overshoot. I'm trying to get it as close to 600 as I can without overshooting. And we overshot. Come back down. Okay, so now we're at 620 watts here. 630. So we can definitely run a little bit over the rating. For fairly lengthy periods of time because we're at at least 30 seconds over time here but if I pump it up some let's go to 700 watts see how long it lasts 700 watts yeah this is a pretty nice inverter And this, by the way, is without the power lifting mode on. This is going over the rated capacity of the inverter. And we're just sitting here at 740 something watts. And it is chugging away like a champion. I would say this inverter is of extremely high quality to be able to go over its rated maximum for this period of time. Yeah, let's bump it back up and see where it cuts off. There we go. We already got it overheated. But we did hit 1100 watts for a minute there in the first test. So that's that's pretty impressive. Overloaded it again. Let's reset it. And it kicks back on with no trouble at all. So resetting it is not a problem. Overloading it is not a problem. It's not actually going to hurt it. Kick the heater back on. Yeah. There we go. And it kicks back on just fine. So AC max draw test. Sound level test. Let's see how much noise this makes with the fans on. First a baseline. Now I have a device in the other room so the sound the device makes isn't going to affect the test. Turn this on. 
on the AC side. Fifty six decibels. Give it some DC power, make a charge. And about fifty five, fifty six decibels. Oh, we just broke sixty, but that's when I was talking. Say fifty six decibels. Very good. Reasonable sound level. The AC60, just like the EB3A, has multiple charging modes built in. There is, to my knowledge, no way of controlling that from the screen. However, you can do so fairly easily from the mobile app. Let me fire that up. Go into the mobile app, connect to the AC60. Go up into the corner and I can pick charging mode. So right now I have it set to silent mode. And I'm going to turn on the power strip, give it some power. And silent mode is not completely silent, as you hear, the fan kicked on. This device is actually quite warm right now, I was just doing some max drain tests, and right before recording this, so it's rather warm, and I did that on purpose to demonstrate that silent mode is not perfectly silent. What silent mode does though is it limits the charging speed to about 150 watts, so just a tiny bit over that. And the purpose of limiting it to 150 watts is to reduce the possibility of needing the fan. It does not, however, slow it down even further if the fan has to turn on. If the thermal management system says the fan's got to turn on, it turns on. Now in the app, I go back to standard mode. That's going to charge at 250 watts, whereas silent mode took 3 hours and 15 minutes dead to full. Normal mode will get you 1 hour and 54 minutes dead to full, or just under 2 hours. It also has a turbo mode. Let's turn that on. And we're at low enough uh, state of charge that we should see a reasonable speed here. Yeah, it jumps up 600 watts. Very nice. Very nice. I've actually measured a tiny bit higher than 600 watts in my testing. Uh, from a cool state, uh, dead to full. Now, what I mean by a cool state is not when you were just abusing the battery to make it turn the fan on. But uh, from a cool state, uh, dead to full, you're looking at uh, one hour, four minutes is what I measured. So about an hour, dead to full. Now, compare this to some other devices, the EB3A. Dead to full is one hour and one minute in dual adapter or turbo mode. That's uh, turbo mode on the EB3A. And the EB55 with two adapters can do it in an hour and a half. So they've definitely improved from the EB55. EB70S is down there at the bottom. Um, it doesn't have a second adapter and dead to full. It takes four hours and 13 minutes and there's nothing you can do to make it go faster. So this is this is uh, miles better than when the uh, EB70S first came out. So nice quick charging and doesn't need an adapter, just a regular plug. Solar charging sweep. So what voltage of solar panels do you need in order to get the uh, AC60 to work? What's the maximum voltage of solar panels that it'll work with? And how much power will it actually pull? So my experimental setup here, I have a big DC power supply. And by big, I mean this puts out 33 amps at 0 to 150 volts. So it's a 5 kilowatt power supply. Way, way, way bigger than the AC60 can possibly pull. So good, we've got enough power. I have two meters. Um, I have an amp meter. This says volts, but it's actually amps. That's amps. And this one is volts. Why do I have two meters hooked up? Because the volt and current on this display are not very accurate. So this gives me a better idea of where I'm actually at. Let us plug in the power. And I'm at 10 volts, so at this point EB3A or the AC60 here um, does not even care. 
And you can see I've left it in uh, turbo mode, kind of on purpose. Um, so we're going to see if that makes it pull any more power, and the answer is it doesn't, but we'll see. So we're at 10 volts, let's move up to 11 volts. Now we get at about 12.5, we get this little solar icon here. If I back it off, let's see the lowest it'll actually charge at. 11.9, it's still going. So somewhere between 11 and 12 volts, it will not charge. So, yeah. At 11 volts, it's nothing. At 12 volts, still nothing. 12.4. There we go, 12.4. So you have to have at least 12.4 volts for it to pull power. And when it does pull power, it starts pulling 8 amps. Why 8 amps? Because that's what a car cigarette lighter can output. So it can charge 12.4. I don't recommend charging it off a car battery when the engine's not running, though, because it's going to kill your car battery. Uh, this probably holds more power than most car batteries do. So now let's uh, continue moving up to 13. Let's get about 13.8. That's a car that's running. The fan kicking on here. 13.8. And we're at 100 watts. So while we're at 100 watts here at this voltage, 13.7, 13.8, I'm going to pop open the app. And I'm going to switch it out of turbo mode just to show you it doesn't do anything. There we go. Now I'm in standard mode. My turbo mode icon has disappeared. And I'm still charging at exactly the same rate. So turbo mode won't make it pull more amps at 12 volts. So understand this, if you're running it out of a car, accidentally leaving it in turbo mode isn't going to blow up your cigarette lighter socket, and it's the same thing, purposefully putting it into turbo mode is not going to make it charge faster off a cigarette lighter port. The only way to charge faster is higher voltage or running it off an inverter. Let's keep giving it more voltage. Let's get up to about 18, that's what a normal solar panel puts out for a standard panel. Here we go, about 18. At one solar panel, we're looking at about 148 watts of charging. That would be your uh, Bluetti PV200 panels. We'll probably do about that. Uh, your 120s won't do that because the uh, 120 panel won't put out 8 amps. But this is as much as it'll pull at 18 volts. It will not charge any faster at 18 volts. Um, turbo mode or not. Let's get up to about 24 volts. That's your more residential sized panels, or a couple of panels working together. And at 24 volts, we are at 199 watts. Now, you do have to be careful with 24 volt panels, because you don't have a lot of overhead. This is rated up to 28 volts. Let's not go over. There we go, 28 volts. And it's continuing to charge. In fact, it will continue to charge a little beyond that. See, my amps are going down here because it won't pull more than 200 watts. So when I get higher up in voltage, it will pull less amps. But very close to here, it's going to go to zero. 29 volts. Thirty volts. Still working at thirty volts. And there we go. Not quite thirty-one volts. I've gone into overload. And it's pulling nothing. So what happens if I don't press any buttons and the voltage on the panels go down on their own? Twenty-eight volts, it's still in overload. I have to get down back down to 27 volts before it resets, but it does auto reset. So if you have solar panels that are right on the edge, you might be hitting that reset. But uh, be very, very careful because it's only rated from the factory for 28 volts. The fact that you can get it up to 30.5 roughly, there you go, I overloaded it again. 
at some point feeding it too much voltage will break it. I don't know where that number is because I'm not going to find it. I don't really want to break this one, but it looks like you can get a little bit above the 28 volts before it starts throwing alarms, and it does. Looks like it auto resets just fine. So looking at the overall solar charging graph that I'm putting up on the screen right now, the charging rate starts low, goes high. You need to have at least uh, 24 volts, roughly, to be able to hit the maximum. Above 24 volts, as long as you can feed it enough amps, it doesn't actually charge any faster. And if I compare the AC60's solar charging to the solar charging of its competitor models with inside Blue Eddy, uh, an interesting note here, you can see the EB55 cuts off at 28 volts, exactly 28 volts. The EB 3A gives you a little bit more headroom. It cuts off at 29. And the AC60 cuts off, as we said, between 30 and uh, 31. And it has 0 at 32. But the uh, solar charging profile graphs between these three devices look very, very similar. So I would guess that it's probably the same engineer that did all three. And uh, honestly, Blue Eddy, uh, don't change anything. This seems to work. Uh, it's a very reliable system does the job and it charges it quite well. Um, the only thing that would be nice is since the batteries on these are much larger, it would be nice to have a method to charge a little faster. But I understand we're already getting into a higher weight class, even though we have the uh, uh, same charger as the EB3A, effectively. AC60 dual charging mode. So the question is, can the AC60 dual charge? Well, of course it can. The question really is, how does it dual charge and whether or not there it will help you do what you need to do. So let me show you what it does. First, I have it set in silent mode, which will limit the wattage charging from AC to 150 watts. Turn on this power supply over here. This meter right here is set to read my inbound AC amperage. You can see I'm pulling in 1.2 amps which works out to about 155 watts. This meter over here is reading DC amperage. I know it says volts, but it's really amps. Just that's, that's the way I've got it hooked up. It's going into a DC power supply set to 25 volts, which should be fast enough to max out the DC input. So let me plug in my uh, simulated solar panel here. And my AC, when I do that, drops drastically. So now I'm only pulling 0.36 amps from AC, and I'm pulling 8 amps from DC. So it prefers solar. Generally, that's a good thing. Solar energy, if you plug in a panel, is generally pretty free. Um, AC power generally costs some money. Uh, however, notice it is uh, basically ignoring the fact that I have it set to silent mode. It's gone up to 250 watts, which is the normal charging rate for standard mode. Now... Let me set it to standard mode while we have it in this configuration. All right. Now it is in standard mode. What happens is my AC actually goes a little faster. So now I'm up to 280 watts. It, does, it really doesn't want to waste solar, which actually makes sense. If you've got enough solar, you shouldn't waste it. Solar itself is uh, flaky. When the sun goes away, you don't get it back. So it makes sense to not waste solar if solar is around. Now, let's set it to turbo mode and see what happens. Okay, I'm on turbo mode. Now my charging speed jumps up dramatically. Almost 600 watts here. I am still pulling full solar, which is exactly what I would want it to do, I am also pulling 3 amps of AC. So it can dual charge. However, let's just say you just want to charge fast. You don't care how you charge, you just want to charge fast. Watch what happens when I unplug the solar. Unplug the solar. Charge at exactly the same speed. 
So it will absolutely do 600 watts, 600 plus watts. Um, off of AC alone, of course, it's not doing it right now, but it did do it while I measured it. And here's that graph again. So turbo mode will reach full speed without panels attached. But of course, if you add solar panels to it, what is it going to do? It's going to use the free energy from the sun as opposed to the pay money energy from your grid or the uh, pay lots of money energy from your generator. So it does pretty much what I would expect it to do. So yeah, relatively smart, but you can actually reach full speed charging uh, without having to dual charge. For our next test, we're going to determine how clean the power is that's coming out of the AC60. Uh, but before I show you the clean power, I need to show you something to compare it to, and I need to explain the test setup. So what we have here, this is an oscilloscope. Um, we should have nice, clean, you know, up and down sine waves. This is something else. Uh, this meter will read total harmonic distortion. It reads voltage total harmonic distortion, which means it needs to plug into the wall, and you can see this cable is plugged into the bottom of the meter. Okay. When you are measuring mains power, please always be careful. Um, my oscilloscope here is running into this cord, which looks the same as the cord from the other meter, but is a different cord. It is then going into a attenuator so I don't blow up the meter, and the meter is running off a battery. So the first thing I'm going to do is plug in both meters. And I'm going to plug both of these meters directly into my Pacific Gas and Electric, because I live in that area wall outlet. Okay, there we go. We have power coming out of the wall outlet. And the power looks kind of sine wavy. That's very nice. And, but how clean is that power? So the fact that it kind of has a waveform pattern doesn't necessarily mean that it's the cleanest power ever. Move that over there. We can, I can see that a little better. So what I can do instead is I can quantify that. So this next meter this guy knows how to actually read the total harmonic distortion. So I am at 7% total harmonic distortion. Generally 5% is considered good. 5% is what you want for medical devices, for audio equipment, that kind of thing. So the pg e power that's coming out of my wall, not so good. Uh, let me give you another reading. This device here is the cheapest inverter you can get on Amazon. Uh, this is about uh, $15. So we're going to show you what a really bad one looks like. So I'm going to unplug this from the wall. Plug my inverter a nice stable 12 volt power source. Put my power outlet into the inverter. And I have oh yuck. What is that? That's not even that that's not yuck. That's called a modified sine wave. Now remember uh, my utility power is at uh, 7%. 5% is considered acceptable. So this is putting out 113 volts, but the total harmonic distortion is 41%. Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> that's just, yeah, the, everything that I would expect from a $15 um, inverter. So, terrible, terrible, terrible. Now, let's take a look, instead of at something bad, let's take a look at the AC60 here. Plug that. Put that away. And let's plug into... AC60, let's turn this on. Give us some AC power. Give it a minute to kick on. Turn on my switch, there we go. Okay, now we have a nice clean sine wave. Nice clean sine wave. And we are at 120.9 volts AC. And if I switch it to harmonic distortion mode, 0.6%. Oh, so so nice, so clean. So, 
yeah, um, this inverter is far better for medical devices, for audio equipment, for sensitive electronics than anything I'm even getting out of my AC utility wall power. This is a very clean inverter. And let's see how it scales. Let's start putting a load on it. Put in a little load to start with, just a small one. And by the way, adding loads to your inverter will absolutely affect the harmonic distortion. Because as you can see here, I've gone from 0 0.6 to 1.1%. And I've plugged in 200 watts. Luckily, you don't have to wait and see me for me to do all the testing on all of these devices uh, because I've already done it. So the AC60 scales from about 0.9% harmonic distortion with a 7.5 watt load. I'm not very interested in a zero load. Uh, up to about 1.9% with a max load out of the box. And I can compare that to two other devices, the uh, EB3A and the EB55. The EB55 is a little worse um, as it gets into the higher end. 600 watts, the EB55, 500 watts, it's, it's up in the twos. Where the uh, AC60 stays below 2% uh, total harmonic distortion. Now this is voltage total harmonic distortion. Uh, up to a 600 watt load. EB3A, same thing. Nice and low. EB3A does have a little spur around um, 300 watts, but other than that, it's real good. And when you're looking at this graph that I'm showing here, uh, be aware, uh, better values are lower. So the best of these three devices at the various wattages that we're looking at is the line that's going to be at the bottom. So lower total harmonic distortion means cleaner power. Next, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about AC and DC efficiency of the AC60. So first off, what is efficiency and why do we care? Um, efficiency is the percentage of the rated battery, usable battery, that is available for your devices when you plug them in. So if you had a device with a very, very large battery but terrible efficiency, you might actually get less power out of it than a device with a really small battery but really great efficiency. So how do we measure this? First off, it's actually pretty simple. Um, you get a meter. Um, this is a cheap one, uh, but it does the job. Um, I have fancier ones too, but this is a cheap one. It's about $15, um, pretty easy to use. Um, and then you need some kind of load. And what I mean by load is a device that you can plug in that uses power. And preferably you want that device that uses power to not change how much power it's using. You want it to be a constant load. You also want it to be what's called a resistive load. In other words, you don't want it to have a lot of coils or motors in it. So a uh, excellent and a very inexpensive load, if you want to do your own testing, is a, a light bulb. This one has a little socket on it. And uh, just, just, it's just the standard screw base and it screws into this little, little socket here. And that gives me a, uh, an AC outlet on it. And I can take the light bulb and I can plug it into my meter. And um, pretty much I'm good to go for, for this test. Uh, what I need to do now is uh, you start with the AC60 at full battery charge. So right now it's actually recharging. You'll notice that the, uh, the meter is not at 100%. But that's fine. We'll, we'll run it as if it's at 100% because I'm not going to record this one in my results. So I open this up. I plug the meter in. And I flip on the power. And my light bulb turns on. And you'd normally do this, obviously, when it's not plugged into power. Um, you'd start it at 100% uh, battery, and you'd let it run until it gets to 0% battery. You don't use the meter. I would not recommend going from 100% to 90% and then multiplying your time by 10. Uh, reason for that is that the meter is not linear. Uh, what I mean by that is that the amount of energy that comes out of the device between 100% and 90% is almost exactly the same amount of energy that comes out of the device between 2% and 0%. So at the top of the meter, you get 10%. At the bottom of the meter, you get 2%. And those percentages are the same amount of power. So the meter is not linear, but that doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> it's not linear. It just means uh, when you run these tests, you have to do a full battery drain every single time. 
And if you wait for that to uh, finish, you will get a single efficiency reading. Uh, I would argue and have argued that a single reading is not enough. Um, mostly because we're not just benchmarking the battery. If we were just benchmarking the battery, batteries are well understood. We can do a single meter. That's easy. However, we're also benchmarking the cooling system, the inverter, the control systems for the inverter, which use power. Um, the software in the device, which may use, who knows, it might be variable amounts of power. We don't know what it's doing inside, inside the software. Um, and everything else that's running in this device. So if you run a single test, you're going to wind up with very different results versus running multiple tests. So I run a bunch of tests and both AC and DC, and I run these so we can compare with each other. So let's bring up a graph here. There we go. And we're going to be looking at the uh, efficiency, AC efficiency of the EB3A, the AC60, and the EB55. Now on this graph, um, bigger numbers are better. So the green line at the top, which happens to be the AC60, that's the most efficient of the three. Yay! Um, so Bluetti knocked it out of the park here. Uh, the gray line is the EB55, and it's actually more efficient than the AC60 between uh, 20 watts and 60 watts. But the entire rest of the line, uh, the AC60 is most efficient out of these units, which is great because it's their newest model. Now let's switch to the DC graph. And the DC graph, first off, the axes are different and, and the shape is different um, because you can't pull as much power out of the DC side as you can the AC side. So we're kind of zoomed in here. And additionally, um, we call out uh, the EB55 actually couldn't complete the highest level tests here. Uh, the EB55 on the DC side um, couldn't do it, and it gave up after an hour and 32 minutes um, at 200 watts. And how do you get 200 watts out of it? You pull some power out of USB-C, and you pull some power out of the uh, cigarette lighter, um, because one single port won't do it. But it gave up after uh, an hour and 43 minutes and turned off the USB-C port. Just could not handle that amount of load. So you can see the, uh, the gray at the uh, right side is uh, lower because that's how much power it did give me. But the EB55 is actually the most efficient DC machine out of these three. The AC60 is more efficient than the EB3A at higher loads. Um, and with the exception of one data point, also higher than the EB3A at lower loads. So the AC60, relatively well designed. Um, I would not particularly discount the EB55 here, um, if you, if you already have one and you're using it as a DC machine, it seems very well put together. Why is the AC60 less efficient? Well, it's got more parts in it. Um, it's got all these features that we've been talking about so far. That energy has to come from somewhere. So it doesn't surprise me that when you add more features, you lose a little bit of efficiency. But um, it is what it is. And additionally, the, uh, the AC60's cooling system is far superior in that the AC60 could actually complete the 200 watt test where the EB55 couldn't do it. Let's take a little bit of time to play with the UPS mode on the AC60. First off, categorization. There are two kinds of UPS modes. There is a offline UPS that has the battery effectively sitting on a shelf doing nothing while power is flowing through the device. That's the type that the AC60 is. There's also an online UPS. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. An offline UPS is designed for devices where, one, the power doesn't go out very often, and two, when it does go out, the devices are tolerant of some amount of loss of power. So here's how I test that. I have an oscilloscope here. Uh, this oscilloscope is set in a trigger mode, and in, in other words, it is effectively going to take a snapshot of a certain period of time. I have the, U, the AZ60 is powered on, and I have this plug here, is going into the data readout on the oscilloscope. I have a second plug here, this is in fact a nine volt power supply, that's going into the second port on the oscilloscope. It's going to trigger when the voltage drops below a certain amount from the nine volt power supply. In other words, I'm gonna flip the switch back there. The nine volt power supply is gonna start losing power. Right now I'm plugged in, I've got grid. When I flip the switch, the nine volt power supply will lose power instantaneously, the voltage will start to drop. At that point, 
the oscilloscope will take a snapshot of the AC waveform, this other plug that's coming out of the AC60, to let you see what happens to the waveform when we actually hit a loss of power event. So I'm going to turn the power off. There we go. So, go into the horizontal mode so I can scroll right and left. See, after the power goes out, I have a nice sine wave. Before the power goes out, I have a nice sine wave. In the middle, I've got kind of nothing. There's just flat flatness there. There's no, there's no sine wave there. Because we actually had lost power during that time period. So, this old scope, by the way, can do this again. Take another reading here. Oops, switch back on first. There we go. And now I can cut the power again and I'll take another reading. There's another one. So one of the questions that people ask is, well, how long from there to there? Well, luckily we can do that. There's a measure button where I can go in here and I can set it to time. I can go to A, start there. Go to B, and that kind of looks sort of waveform ish right there. And from A to B is 15.80 milliseconds. The spec is 20 milliseconds, so you can lose power for 20 milliseconds, and almost all of your devices will not actually shut off during that time period. So as long as you have something kind of waveform looking outside of that range, you're probably pretty good. So let's do that test again. That was 15.8. Reset it. And there's another one. Go back to measure. To A. And to B. And it starts looking way for me right about there. And that one is 19.2 milliseconds. Let's go again. And as you guys can see, it kind of depends on luck of the draw as to exactly where it hits in the middle of the waveform for the cut on and cut off. That one just happened to line up perfectly. That's very nice. Do one more then, since I don't have to measure that one. And there's one more. So A. And B, 15 milliseconds. So... These three readings just so happened to all be under the 20 millisecond threshold. However, it is possible, based on where it is in the waveform that you lose power, that you can actually lose power for more than 20 milliseconds before the system kicks back on. It's very possible, which means your devices could have a short loss of power event. However, there's a very easy way around that. So I've now converted my offline UPS to an online UPS. How I've done that is I've unplugged the power cable that came with it, and I'm instead running it off the power brick that came with the EB55. This is the uh, T200S power supply, by the way, and uh, you can purchase this separately. You don't have to get it with the, you don't have to go buy an EB55 to get one of these. Um, it just happens to be the one that came with it when I got my EB55. So now what's happening is the power is going through the power brick into the solar input, through the inverter, out the inverter is AC, and into my oscilloscope. When I turn the power off, you can see it doesn't trigger, which means there was no loss of power on this output. It does eventually trigger, but it did not trigger when I cut the power off. So that tells me that there's no, no loss of power event that has happened there. So you can avoid loss of power events entirely by running the device off of a DC input. And what DC input would you need? You would need Bluetti's T200S power adapter. There is an, one additional mode they've thrown at us, though, just to make things a little easier. This test is designed to simulate either the washing machine test, the furnace test, the dryer test, whatever you'd like to call it, where I have a very large appliance. It's got a motor or some other thing with a very large in-rust current in it. 
uh, this particular device happens to have a very large inrush current, as you can see. My AC60 is plugged into the same wall socket. This isn't even plugged into this. They're just plugged into the same socket. So this is going to the wall. This is going to the wall. They both go into the wall. The output of this is not plugged into this. However, when I turn this on, it's going to destabilize the circuit enough that this oscilloscope is going to lose power for a very, very short period of time. And watch. And it does. See, my AFC waveform is not very nice looking for the tiny, tiny period of time when I flip that switch. If I flip the switch back, it takes it a second to turn off. I can reproduce this every single time. Now, how do you fix this? Well, the simple way would be to use an online UPS, as I just showed you. You put the power supply in, it, this, this isn't going to do a thing. So if you've got your AC60 or your EB3A, by the way, uh, running off the same circuit as a uh, very large appliance, um, which you shouldn't do in the first place, a way to get around that is to run them off DC. However, in the AC60, Bluetti has introduced a new feature uh, which can help us deal with this situation. So I'm going to bring up the app here. There we go, got the app. And I'm going to go into the menu. I'm going to go under Advanced Settings. And I'm going to turn on this new grid boosting mode. What grid boosting mode does is it gives you a delay between when it detects the power starting to get a little weird and when it actually switches to the battery inside. When it does the switch, that's when you lose power. That's this flat line right there. So if I can get it to wait a little bit, sometimes now it's not going to switch. Sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. And in the times when it doesn't switch, that means the devices that were plugged into this didn't lose power at all. Now they got kind of a funny looking waveform, but they're not going to lose power. Let me show you what that looks like. See if I can get it to not lose power on camera, of course. Well, there we go. Of course it lost it. But sometimes this isn't going to trigger. And you'll get a situation where you'll have the power hiccup less often. In other words, it is optimizing for a brownout instead of optimizing for a blackout. So if you have your device, your AC60, powering something, and you've got a very large device on the same circuit as your AC60, something like a big power supply, something like a washing machine, a dryer, something like that, you can have a more stable environment for your devices if you simply turn on the grid boost mode. In which case then, sometimes you will still see a loss of power just like I'm seeing here. But sometimes you'll have the device turn on and you won't lose power. So that'll make things a little bit more resilient. That's what it's for. The downside of grid boost mode is when you do get a blackout, when I do go back here and flip this power switch and turn the device off, the time between A and B on that oscilloscope, the right and the left, is probably going to be longer. So it really optimizes for brownouts, but it de-optimizes for blackouts. So understand what that does, and, and use it if you need it. it. It's there. They've added it in for us to use because there are times when people need it. We've done a number of tests on the A660, and we've come about to the end of the video. So, what do I think of it? Well, they got all the fundamentals right. It's got a solid inverter. It's got really good efficiency numbers, especially on AC. It's got reasonable weight, reasonable size, easy to move around. The fact that they added waterproof to it, or at least an IP65 water-resistant um, rating, that's going to be a great peace of mind for people who bring it out. They go camping. They go in areas where it might get wet accidentally. And, well, now you don't have to worry about it, assuming the feature works as advertised, which we will test in a later video. The thing I'm really excited about for this device, though, is the promise of being able to connect the extra batteries to it to make it into a very large battery, small inverter unit. That's going to be really cool and really exciting when it's available. But, again, those batteries aren't out yet, so I haven't been able to test it. So what's not as exciting about the AC60? 
Um, <clears throat> lack of the 5521 ports. Uh, the uh, DC side of the device really needs to be able to handle if it's going to be the small unit with large battery. People are going to be running vans off these things. Right now, it's only got, you know, 112 volt output. I did check with Blue Eddy. Uh, the batteries themselves are slated to have another cigarette lighter port on each battery. So when you connect up the additional batteries, that'll give you three 12 volt circuits. So that kind of honestly mostly fixes that issue, but again, assuming that that is how it's going to work, which we will test when the batteries arrive. So, sort of a plus and a minus. Um, we did see a little bit of an odd result with that 12-volt uh, test, the max drain 12-volt test, where it went down to 4 volts above 10 amps. I've reported that to Blue Eddy as a bug, so I'm expecting that to get fixed. Um, we shouldn't have any trouble with the release units. This, this one, again, is a prototype, so it, it does kind of strange things. Uh, the other thing that I'd ask for here, it would be really nice if we had a feature just to make the screen stay on. That would be nice. Um, other than that, it's a pretty darn solid unit. Uh, as of the time of this recording, uh, pricing has not been announced, so I can't comment on that as long as pricing is reasonable, which Blue Eddy pricing tends to be reasonable, uh, I expect they're going to sell these things like hotcakes. So thank you all for watching. And as always, um, I do not make any money off these videos. Uh, I do work in the tech industry. I do not work in the solar generator industry. I make my money elsewhere in tech. I'm not paid to do these videos. Uh, the channel is not monetized. Blue Eddy does not pay me to do these videos. And Blue Eddy certainly does not have any control over the content. Uh, they do send me the review unit to test, because otherwise I would just wouldn't be able to get it. Um, but uh, other than that, um, I make these videos because they're fun to make. And if you guys enjoy watching them, I'll continue making them. So have fun out there, and thank you all.